Today, I'd like to talk a little bit about point of view. Now, you're probably aware of the different points of view that you can typically use in a story. If I tell a story in first person, then I tell it from the point of, I did this, I did that. This is kind of a natural way to uh, express ourselves. If you're going to express yourself in a testimony, uh, let's say you witnessed a, a bank robbery, uh, you would tell the judge what you saw, and you would do it in first person. Now, if you were to talk about something that another person did, you could say, you did this, you did that. That's second person, and that's one way to tell a story. It's kind of accusatory, though. Uh, that's about the only time that we ever use this. You did this, you did that. Um, third person is when we say that another person did something, okay? He did this, she did this, they did that. And you can tell a story in third person just fine, too. Um, and then, of course, we get into other types of viewpoint. The omniscient viewpoint is one that comes up from time to time. That's where the author tells the story. It's not a person, but it's um, a disembodied author very often. Okay, And that author is getting into the heads of each of the people and telling the story from maybe multiple viewpoints. And omniscient can work quite well. However, when you're telling a story, each viewpoint has its own weaknesses and problems. Okay, uh, There are reasons why certain ones are used. For example, um, it used to be that back in the 1950s or 60s, almost all stories were told in third person. However, uh, recently we've had some huge successes. Uh, we've had some huge successes with stories told in first person. And so when we got to uh, something like Twilight or The Hunger Games, uh, authors told their stories in first person, and now that's become very uh, popular in the, uh, in the young adult genre. So much so that recently an author sent me a, a rejection slip from, uh, from her editor who said, um, I was reading your story and was just loving it. And then on the 27th page, I suddenly realized this story is told in third person. And we only take stories in first person. We're a young adult publisher. Of course, that's sheer lunacy. Orson Scott Card wrote an entire book on characters and viewpoint in which he explores the different viewpoints that you can use and why some work better than others. He suggests that we typically need to write most stories in third person uh, what he calls in deep penetration, where we get deep into the minds of his of our characters. And I agree with him on that. That works best for almost all fiction. There are problems with other viewpoints. There are also workarounds for those viewpoints. And so, uh, yeah, you can, do it, you can do it a number of ways. However, there are certain things that don't work. For example, a while back, I was reading a story that was written in omniscient viewpoint. And it was written uh, so that every third paragraph, sometimes every other paragraph, switched points of view. So, for example, we had a character who comes in, a big barbarian, comes to the door. An old man at the night uh, is wakened by it, and he sees this huge looming shadow uh, there in the doorway, and he shrinks back in terror. And then we'd pop into the point of view of the big barbarian with the axe on his back who says, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to frighten you. Um, that absolutely destroyed the scene, okay? There would have been some nice terror there and uh, at a good reveal when we find out that the guy is just there for calm, peaceful purposes. As it was, it was a mess. Uh, every time that a little bit of tension was built up. It was destroyed immediately. Imagine how hard it would be to ask somebody to marry you if you knew within three seconds exactly what they were thinking. Okay, that head hopping absolutely destroyed the novel. In fact, it destroyed it so badly that I turned it back into the author who was paying me to edit it and said, don't have me bother because you need to go fix your viewpoint before this is even worth looking at. Okay. Um, and so head hopping tends to destroy all the tension in a story. Now, there was a story that won a Nobel Prize. A novelist who won the Nobel Prize 
for a book that was written in omniscient viewpoint. However, uh, the interesting thing about the book was that it was about characters who were unlikable. And by the end of the book, you hated the whole damn group of people and wished they were all dead. So she, he was able in that particular case to get that across through the omniscient viewpoint. These people are all unlikable and you shouldn't bother reading the rest of this book. Um, so I think you want to look at this and say, yeah, omniscient viewpoint can work well. If you look at certain books like Lord of the Rings, for example, or even Harry Potter, we have an omniscient viewpoint. But what happens is that the author starts off uh, in a viewpoint and then gets into a character and follows that character all through the story. And it works that way quite well. If you do head hopping, uh, it will destroy the story. More than that, it's hard for young readers a lot of times to enjoy a story that's written in multiple viewpoints. I've had books that uh, uh, I did a great job, for example, of switching points of view slowly so that people wouldn't even notice it. And 12-year-old kids notice it. They'd say, why did you do that to me? You started out in Amber's point of view and then you went to Ben's. And, uh, and even a 12-year-old noticed it because for them, when they're not capable of thinking symbolically, it's difficult to think about what another person would do in a situation. They get really grounded in a character. Orson Scott Card recently in a talk that he gave in uh, Writers of the Future told readers that whenever you love a story, when you look at what you consider to be great writing, he said it's all point of view. The person who handles point of view the best is going to be the one that you think of as the greatest writer, okay? Um, I want you to think of your story as being, you know, I want you to think of yourself as being like a, uh, a tower that's transmitting a beam, transmitting information, for example, to a television disc. And the television disc is sitting out there and you're trans transmitting this information. If you transmit it clearly and the person out there picks it up clearly on their receiver, they'll duplicate what you, what you sent. Uh, on the other hand, if they get a poor transmission, then what happens is uh, they get confused. They're, they're trying to figure out what's going on on their television. They're looking at a fuzzy screen. They're hearing parts of dialogue, but maybe not everything else coming through because it's garbled. And, and that's a, a bad transmission. Your job as a writer is to transmit information as clearly as you can. And the way that you do that is by transmitting it through the senses, okay? Now you've been taught that there are five senses that we have sight, sound, uh, taste, touch, smell. The problem with that is, is that that's not quite all of it. I want you to think of human beings as input devices, okay? Humans have all of those senses, but we have other things that we feel too. We have emotions that are coming through all the time. Our brain is releasing hormones uh, that uh, go into our hypothalamus, and, and so we're feeling fear and anger, and we're feeling uh, boredom and fatigue and things like that. So that's one thing that has to be communicated to the reader. If you get into a deep point of view, then you need to always make sure that you're communicating emotions. Another thing that we're communicating is thoughts. You have a running dialogue going on in your head. Your character should have a running dialogue going on in their head. If they don't, the reader notices. They feel that there's something wrong because that's not the way that people actually react to information. Uh, we have thoughts that are going on. You have a sense of time. You may have a sense of, uh, of place, okay? This is where I am in relation to the rest of the universe. I can feel things. A lot of people feel that they have a spiritual sense. And if you're writing religious fiction, you darn well better have that in there too. Otherwise, the spiritual reader will say, this isn't communicating to me. What's going on? This person doesn't feel real to me somehow. So when you are dealing with input devices, you have to carefully construct what is happening in a scene. 
What is a person seeing? What are they hearing? What are they feeling emotionally? What are they thinking? What are they smelling? What's going on tactily? What do they do they feel hot, cold, wet, dry? All of these things go in. And if you can handle that really well, then what happens is people will be transported into your story and they'll think that you're a great writer. It doesn't require a lot of talent. What it does is it requires a little bit of street smarts. Yeah. If you'd like more information on how to do Viewpoint well, I'd like you to look at the classes in Writing and Chanting Prose. Look in the first four classes and we're going to get deeper into that, uh, how to use all of the senses in your story.